Morning folks, how we doing? It's the start of week two. I'm getting some recording done here on a Monday morning. Getting a little weird with some air. Yeah. Okay, give it a few more minutes and then we'll get started here. I love this track. Hope you all, your weekend went well, you got your homework done. I saw a lot of you got that. Okay, I could jam out to this all day, but it's time to get it going. All right, folks, so we're getting into this chapter two here. Um, and chapter two is all about diving in um, to the atom, atom uh, uh, molecules and ions. We're gonna really start building up um, the chemistry. And I'm going to start this chapter by telling you a story of a number of scientists um, whose discoveries all led to understanding the structure of an atom. And so the first person I want to talk about is J.J. Uh, Thompson. So let me make this a little bit thicker. So now you can see that I've got names and years and stuff. I'm not going to make you like memorize names and years and where all these people are from and what they did. This is more for your own interest. Um, but I'll review the learning goals here momentarily. Um, and what I do want you to understand is the structure of the atom. Um, so J.J. Thompson um, gave us the famous uh, cathode ray tube experiment. And so the way this experiment went, um, he had this evacuated tube. And in this tube, of course, he had a cathode um, and an anode. Um, if you take Kim 110 here, um, like all of you will, um, we'll really dive into the electrochemistry and what's going on here. But you have a high voltage source, basically a battery, okay? Um, and when you put a, a negative charge on the cathode and a positive charge on this anode, you're separating the charges. Um, and what ends up happening is electrons um, want to flow to complete that circuit. We'll get into that in far more detail in Chem 110. But in any event, this ends up creating, um, effectively, it's an electron gun, is what it is, okay? So these electrons fired out of this anode here, and behind uh, this, what you see here, this phosphorescent um, coating. So what that allowed um, J.J. Thompson to do was to view the beam of electrons. You couldn't see them. They'd be invisible to the eye. Um, but under this phosphor screen, they light up, they glow when they hit that phosphor screen. Um, much like when you have, uh, when you turn a black light on and you see like your fluorescent or your phosphorescent um, clothing, okay? And so what J.J. Thompson noticed when he put um, magnets um, on either side of the electron beam, he could get that electron beam to curve into the magnetic field, okay? Or similarly, when he put charged electric plates, um, the electron beam also traveled, was influenced by these electric plates. And he always noticed that the electron beam wanted to travel towards the positively charged plate. Um, so this allowed him to conclude whatever particles were coming out of here had to be uh, negatively charged because they were always attracted to the positively charged plate. Okay. And as it turns out, as we'll discover later in the semester, um, electrons spin and a spinning um, charge, something that's got a charge and spins, ends up having a magnetic moment. So that's how these electrons, because they're also um, spinning round and round, that gives them magnetism. And that's why they were also influenced by this um, by the magnetic field of those two uh, plates, okay? So that's the, um, the cathode ray tube experiment which led to the discovery of an electron, but by no means has the atom been discovered, right? Science is collaborative, okay? So around the same time, Robert Millikan, um, who's an American, he's actually from Caltech, um, pretty cool. Um, so he did the famous oil drop experiment. And um, this experiment, I'll, I'll describe it in a moment, but basically the results of this experiment in combination with J.J. Thompson's experiment allowed us to figure out, yes, the electron is negatively charged. And so it has a charge of 
negative 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 a coulomb. Uh, let's see if I can spell coulomb. I'm a terrible speller. So coulomb is a unit of charge. Okay. And he also determined um, with great precision the mass of the electron. 9.109 times 10 to the minus 28 grams. That's tiny. Teeny, teeny, tiny. So how is Robert Millikan able to do this? Well, in this experiment, okay, he had this large um, chamber and it had positively charged plate and a negatively charged plate. That's these blue plates here. Um, he also had an atomizer. So an atomizer is also very similar to um, a vaporizer or a nebulizer. So you can put some liquid in it and squeeze this bulb and it's going to sit out like uh, push out like a cloud of particles in this case oil particles okay and all of these oil particles or oil drops they're not charged it's just regular oil okay and so they started falling down this tube um, due to the effect of gravity right gravity is going to bring these things down however he also shot some x-rays through this and those x-rays influence the oil drops to become ionized so if we have here an oil drop and it's getting fired at by an x-ray the x-ray is energetic enough um, to knock out some um, electrons as it turns out it knocks out electrons out of the oil drop and left the oil drop uh, positively charged and even some of these oil drops were left negatively charged okay so because some of the x-rays were also able to strip some of the bonds out of the molecule so these oil drops become charged okay and as a result uh, let's erase that because that picture is rather confusing so basically let's just say after the x-rays shoot the oil drops they come out and they have this charge on them okay and the ones that are positively charged are going to get attracted to the negative plate and of course the ones that were negatively charged are going to get attracted to the positive plate see here's a positively charged plate right here and a negatively charged uh, plate right there and what's really cool about this in the case of the negatively charged particles right um, gravity wants to make these particles fall downward let's see if i can change the color here for this thing yes yeah, so gravity wants these particles to fall downwards right all right force due to gravity however in the case of these negatively charged particles because there's this positively charged plate here those particles were actually attracted up so i'm going to say force due um, to the charge okay and so what millikan observed in this little microscope were some particles were floating up some particles were of course falling down and some particles were perfectly balanced right in the middle so their mass and their charge would allow them to just float between these two charged plates so a really really cool experiment and what that allowed him to determine this charge that's on these particles um, can exert a certain force when put into this this um, electric field and that allowed him to determine what the charge and mass of the electron was in combination with J.J. Thompson's experiment. So J.J. Thompson was able to figure out what I'm going to call the mass to charge uh, ratio. So based on how much these particles were curving and deflecting, he could figure out what the mass to charge ratio was. But in combination with Robert Millikan's experiment, they were actually able to determine both of those two numbers, which is really cool, okay? So now we have this idea that matter contains these things called electrons. But the scientists at the time still did not know how these electrons were distributed through the atom. So then J.J. Thompson, um, so he was uh, British, okay? And so he gave an analogy of plum pudding. Um, plum pudding is not uh, pudding. Plum pudding is raisin bread um it's a you know it's a british thing raisin bread don't ask me why i'm not from england uh, but anyways here's plum pudding and so 
In plum pudding, you have these raisins like all distributed out through the bread, right? So J.J. Thompson thought that the atom was all this positively charged stuff. So positive charges distributed throughout a spherical atom and all like the little raisins, if you will, were the electrons, okay? Kind of randomly spread out through the atom, okay? As we know now, that's not correct, but it's not a bad first guess because he's basing this, you know, off of um, his observations, right? We talked about the scientific method last week. Um, so he got a set of observations and is trying to use um, that hypothesis motivated uh, science to describe what's happening, okay? So then comes along Mary Curie, okay? And with her husband Pierre and another gentleman named Henry Bacquerel, um, they famously said, gentlemen, you have misunderstood the atom, okay? Um, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about Mary Curie right now because in Chem 110, we're going to talk about um, radioactivity and radiation, and we'll get into a ton of detail. But you should totally check out this movie. I think it's on Amazon Prime. Okay. There is a brand new movie. My wife and I actually just watched this the other day That's all that, that describes Mary Curie and her life's work. Um, so cool. I thought it was such a cool movie. You should totally watch it. Um, so in the movie, they show um, famously how she was able to discover um, two new elements, plutonium and radium, um, by using this material called pitch blend or uranite. Um, they had to go through tons and tons and tons of pitch blend. And of course, watching them do their work you know, makes you cringe because they're holding like these samples of polonium and radium and they had no idea just how toxic that stuff was. And they're just holding it like sleeping with it in bed, like these little glowing containers. Um, so watch the movie about Marie Curie on Amazon Prime. It's really cool. But famously, she and, um, and her colleagues were able to show how people had completely misunderstood the structure of the atom. Okay. Um, so then now this gets us to the famous gold foil experiment conducted by um, Ernest Rutherford. He's from uh, New Zealand, okay? Um, and what Ernest Rutherford was able to do was take a source of um, radiation, a source of radioactivity that um, because of Marie Curie's work, we're now able to, um, to do that, to use radioactivity. So an alpha emitter is, is an alpha particle, okay? So we'll just say... Um, radiation, okay, in the form of an alpha particle. And he took a very thin piece of gold foil. Um, so imagine aluminum foil, right, but made out of gold, okay. And he had another one of these um, screens that would allow him to see any particles or electrons. Of course, they had to they have to strike the screen so that he can see them. You know, they're not going to be able to see the beam like is shown in this picture. Um, but this fluorescent screen is going to show you any, you know, particles that um, deflect, um, specifically the alpha particles, right? And so what he found was the vast majority of the particles just went straight through, okay? Went straight through the foil and appeared on the other side. However, some of them came straight back. Some of them were deflected at some angle, Okay, right? So these are all particles that are now being deflected. And he, he famously said the result was comparable to shooting a howitzer at a piece of paper and having the shell reflected back. Okay, in the case of these beams that are coming like straight back. Shooting a howitzer at a piece of paper and having the shell come back. In case you don't know what a howitzer is, uh, this is what a howitzer is. So could you imagine having like a piece of paper right there and then it like comes flying back at you? That, and that's the equivalent analogy. That is what happened. So what's going on here? Okay. So this is J.J. Um, Thompson's, you know, plum pudding model. Okay. And so the idea here, if there is there, if there is this region of positive charge that's like spread throughout the atom, um, then these alpha particles should just pass straight through. Maybe occasionally when they hit an electron, they'll be deflected. Um, but given just how tiny 
these electrons are. Um, right, Rutherford already knew how tiny they were from J.J. Thompson and Robert Millikan's work. There's no way one of those alpha particles could be deflected by an electron because, as we'll learn, an alpha particle contains two protons and two neutrons. So it's a helium uh, nucleus. We'll learn that as we as we progress through the semester. Okay. Um, so these alpha particles are really quite giant compared to an electron. So if they hit an electron, they should just shred it to pieces. And in fact, that's exactly what happened in Robert Millikan's experiment, right? He wasn't using alpha particles, but he was using x-rays. And those x-rays were able to shred electrons and bonds um, out of the oil so that it left the oil charged, okay? So now this is what allowed Rutherford, he was able to refine the hypothesis of the structure of the atom. And this was the result. This was the conclusion he came up with that there had to be some extremely dense, so this says concentrated, I'm going to write extremely dense region of positive charge and mass at the center of the atom. Everything else, this, this blue area, this is called a diffuse electron cloud. We now know that that is like virtually nothing. There's basically vacuum in this diffuse electron cloud. And of course, occasionally electrons spread around. So that idea of J.J. Thompson's plum pudding model was somewhat correct, that these electrons are spread around. But the material between the electrons and this dense material at the core that we call the nucleus, um, it was kind of unexpected that this area was largely nothing and that this nucleus is extremely dense, dense enough that you could fire an alpha particle at it and it would fire right back. Okay, And when I say extremely dense, I'll give you just an approximate den density. So remember, density of water, we talked about densities last week, and you'll continue to um, talk about density um, in your lab. Okay, So the density of the nucleus, if you could take a bunch of protons and neutrons and distill them down, okay, it's about 10 to the positive 15 grams per milliliter or grams per cubic centimeter. 10 to the 15, that's like the mass of a mountain distilled down to like one cubic centimeter. That's crazy, okay? So what we have here, what we learned from J.J. Thompson, Robert Millikan, Ernest Rutherford, and Murray Curry, okay? All of their results, okay? All of their results combined helped us that for one, atoms are mostly empty space. This diffuse electron cloud is mostly empty space. There is an extremely dense and massive core in the middle, okay? And that makes up the vast majority of the mass of the atom. So for example here, if we look at the masses of the electrons now, so here in unit of kilograms, okay? Um, nine times 10 to the minus 31. It's crazy small. Protons and neutrons to the minus 27. That's still extremely small. But consider the difference between these, right? This is a factor of 10,000 times. So the protons and the neutrons are 10,000 times more massive than the electron. And so the vast majority of the mass of an atom is in the nucleus, in the protons and the neutrons, okay? And then the charge, they were able to discover, right, the electron is negative one, the proton is positive one. So when we write charge in chemistry, just to not confuse negative numbers, you'll see us write the sign on the right side instead of the left. You're probably used to seeing this. You know, that means, um, let's just be clear, negative one as like the number. Okay, this is negative one charge. Okay, we write it that way just so we know we're not talking about negative numbers, we're talking about the charge. But now you look at this little asterisk right here, the magnitude in charge of the electron and proton is, so that means the electron is negative 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 coulomb. That's a very, very small number, okay? And then the proton is positive 1.60 
1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 Coulomb. And what we do, and so now I put the negative sign because that negative sign is in reference to that C for Coulomb, okay? So now what we do in chemistry, we say this is all equivalent to one minus. And we say this is all equivalent to one plus. So in this class, when you see us write one minus and one plus, or even two plus, three plus, four minus, it's really this number, you know, times two or three or four, whatever the number is, okay? You don't have to memorize numbers. I'll always give you numbers, but recognize that the, the charge of a single electron, single solitary electron is a tiny, tiny number, okay? Of course, if we have a lot of electrons, like billions and trillions of electrons, then we would have quite a lot of charge, okay? So we're gonna build that up here as we go, okay? So now, um, here's a cool analogy for you for the structure of the atom, okay? So the size of an atom is roughly 10 to the minus eight centimeters. That's tiny. That's one over 10 billion centimeters, right? It's really, really tiny. And that's the size of like the whole atom itself, right? Where keep in mind, this is mostly nothing, right? Some diffuse electron cloud. However, in the center, there's that really dense and massive nucleus. And it's about 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. So that's one over, uh, let's see here, that's gonna be um, one over 10 trillion, excuse me, that's not 10 trillion. You get the idea, I can't think right now off the top of my head. It's crazy small, it's crazy, crazy small. So the difference between five and eight that's a factor of a hundred thousand times smaller. So the nucleus is a hundred thousand times smaller than the atom itself. So here's an equivalent analogy. Okay. Here is where we would be sitting if classes were, you know, back to normal face to face. There's HSU's campus and Arcata. All right. And all the way up about 35 miles away is the entrance to Redwood National Park. Beautiful, when you get up here, if you're not up here yet, it's absolutely stunning. You gotta make this drive up the coast. Beautiful drive, get all the way up here, you pass the lagoons, you get into the entrance to the park, it's just gorgeous, okay? So that's a 35 mile drive. Now imagine if I took a basketball that's roughly 30 inches and I placed that basketball in the middle of the highway on this stretch of road, 35 miles, okay? Now imagine I made a radius, or excuse me, I made a, a diameter out of that road, right? 35 miles as my diameter. So some crazy large circumference that goes way out into the ocean and so on. This would be our relative scale of the atom. If the basketball were the nucleus, okay? then that means that the size of the atom would span from HSU all the way up to the Redwoods, and all of this stuff in between would be nothing. It would be vacuum. All of that ocean, all of the mountains, all of these Redwoods, all of you people, if you're in this circle, it would be nothing if the nucleus were the size of a basketball. Pretty amazing. Another equivalent analogy is if you took a marble, I don't have one right here, but imagine like a regular old marble, glass marble, and we put it in the middle of a football stadium. The entire football stadium, like, you know, something like professional sized football stadium, like not Redwood Park, or, uh, the Redwood Bowl, but like some huge big ass stadium, okay? So that would be the size of the atom if the nucleus were the size of a marble that we put in the center. And of course, that football stadium, it'd be all vacuum, right? Nothing is in it. Amazing, just how truly, how much empty space there is in an atom. And if you think about it, the entire universe is made up of atoms, right? This table, me, the air I'm breathing. And atoms are mostly empty space. So what does that tell us about the universe? 
It's kind of sad, but I think it's kind of beautiful. The universe is mostly empty. That is true. That is factual. Even this solid table is mostly empty space. It's amazing, right? Completely amazing. Okay. Oh, yes. Black Lives Matter. Okay. So finally, let me back up. So sorry. I, I forgot the slide was coming up. Um, I forgot what order it was in. Okay. So just to summarize. Okay. What we learned from J.J. Thompson, Robert Milliken, and Ernest Rutherford and Marie Curie. Okay. We learned the structure of the atom. Here we go, right here. Understand the Rutherford model and the structure of the atom and its basic components. So um, that kind of story, that long-winded story I gave you is all about the Rutherford model of the atom. Okay. So now what I wanted to say here, so all these folks that we talked about, um, they're, they're legends, right? We, we memorialize them. We know their names. We name atoms after them. We name units after them. I wanted to tell you about some folks um, that maybe you've never heard about, okay? Black Lives Matter, Black Chemists Matter, okay? So this is a really cool document um, made by the American Chemical Society right there. Five Black Chemists Who Made a Difference. Um, so I would highly encourage you to read about these folks. These folks have made some amazing contributions to science. And obviously there's a lot more than five. Um, this is a really cool infographic that was made this year. Um, Black Chemist Week was August. Oh, I can't write. Um, it was August 12th through 19th this year. So that's when um, this document came out. Okay. So just the week before we got to school was Black Chemists Week. Um, so I put a bunch of stuff on my Twitter. You should check that out. So just to highlight a few of these folks, um, Mae Jemison, first African-American woman to fly in space. And she has a BS in chemical engineering. That's amazing. It's already difficult enough to get a degree in chemical engineering. Um, and then she went and became an astronaut. Yeah, girl, do it. And that happened in 1992. And she was also the first astronaut to appear on Star Trek. Pretty cool stuff. Um, and then uh, one more person I'll point out from this list, George Washington Carver. He was born a slave and died a PhD scientist. Incredible, amazing, okay? So read about these people. Um, you can go to this website here, check it out, y'all. Okay, so this is gonna be the last section that I talk about in this lecture. Um, or wait, I think I might have two more. So. Um, Isotope. So now we're kind of really diving into the structure of the atom. Okay, so we know the nucleus is where all the mass is. The nucleus is made up of protons and neutrons. All this red stuff that you see right here, I'm going to write electron cloud. And really that's like a diffuse electron cloud, but we recognize, right, that there's electrons kind of like spread out all over here. Well, can I do 11 spots? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. There's 11 electrons. Okay, so we're going to use sodium as an example here. All right. And um, as it turns out, as um, these folks discovered, there are different flavors of atoms. So I'm going to say isotopes. And I like to call that a different flavor of an atom. And it's all about the neutrons, the protons and the neutrons. That's what makes the atom unique. The electrons certainly are important. The electrons are what drive chemistry, but it's really the ratio of protons and neutrons in the nucleus that make an atom unique, okay? So for example, here is sodium 23. What is that 23? That 23 is the mass number and it goes in the upper left superscript, okay? That number 23 is the number of protons and neutrons. So 11 plus 12 equals 23, okay? Because the mass is all in the protons and the neutrons. So when we talk about sodium 23, it's really, its mass is a result of having 23 of those things, okay? And let's just go back to that um, chart, right? You can see both the proton and the neutron. It looks like they have the same mass. If I added more sig figs, 
their mass would be just slightly different, but um, even so, the protons and the neutrons have about the same mass, okay? So when I talk about sodium 23, 23 is, is the important number, okay? So then now what about this number down here? Well, that's the atomic number, and that number of protons, that's what makes it a unique atom, okay? So we can refine this statement I made about flavors just a little bit. The neutrons are what give it its unique flavor. The protons are what make it a unique atom. So I really should have started by saying protons make it a unique atom. And as you start adding more neutrons, you get a different flavor of that atom. Okay. So for example, sodium 24 still has 11 protons. If it had a different number of protons, it would be a different atom, all right? But sodium-24 has 13 neutrons, so 11 plus 13 equals 24. Still, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 electrons spread around, okay? But a different number of neutrons. Okay, so understand how we put together this symbol. Mass number, left superscript, atomic number, left subscript. Atomic number gives us the number of protons. Mass number gives us the number of um, protons plus neutrons. We don't have a number here telling us how many neutrons. So what we need to do is say 23 minus 11. So that means it would have to have 12 neutrons. Similarly with sodium 24, 24 minus 11, 24 minus 11 gives me 13 neutrons okay real quick let's oops let's see here be familiar with the isotope and how to distinguish them using mass number atomic number and atomic symbols oops let's see let me highlight as we're going yeah there's the highlight button so we talked about the rutherford model we just talked about isotopes how to distinguish them using mass number atomic number and atomic symbols i'm going to spend a little more time with this with the isotopes okay so let's see, let's back up for a second. And now I'm going to take this, this notion, all right, that our atoms are unique. They're based on the number of protons. Add a different number of protons and you have a different atom. Add a different number of neutrons and you have a different flavor of that same atom. Okay. So if we want to know now how many atoms we have, Remember, these things are tiny. They're so tiny. We're never going to be able to mass them individually. But we can mass them with a collection. Okay? Or vice versa, if we want to know how many that we have, how many atoms we have, we can count them by weighing. Okay? So, for example, suppose we go to the fair. Oh, and I was so looking forward to the Humboldt County Fair this year damn Rona. Okay. Anyways. So you go to that little game, right? Where the guy's like, how many jelly beans do I have in this jar? And you try to guess. And if you guess right, you get all the jelly beans. Okay. So obviously you all are intelligent enough people to know it would be impossible to count all of these jelly beans. And imagine now just for a second, they're not jelly beans, but they're atoms. It would be especially impossible to do that. Okay. But suppose we get our hand on one of them, maybe 10 of them even. And we weigh them. We take an average, right? Look, here's our average. One mass was 5.1, 5.2. Oops, I should have said 5.0, right? So we have the same level of precision for each measurement, okay? And we get an average that it's 5.0. So then when the guy's not looking, we weigh the entire jar and not including the mass of the jar itself, right? But we say that the jar is 5.54 kilograms. So that's now 5.4 five kilograms. Oops, wait a second. Let me, um, yeah, we can do it like this. Okay. So we could say in one kilogram, we know there's a thousand grams, right? So then now, uh, I can then finally also say, well, I know that 5.0 grams is one jelly bean. So remember, I went down, up, down, up, down, up. Okay? 5.45 kilograms. In one kilogram, there's 1,000 grams. Five grams is one jelly bean, so all of those cancel. And what I'm left with is how many beans that I have. 
And if I were to go and do this number, I would get 1,090. Okay? So this is exactly how we take the mass of atoms, exactly how we count atoms. We recognize that some atoms, for example, sodium, some are going to be sodium 23. Some of them are going to be sodium 24. And so when I go and scoop up a pile of sodium, some's going to be 23, some's going to be 24. So the amount of sodium I have is going to be some average. It's going to be some average mass. Just like when I scoop up these jelly beans, some were 5.1, some were 5.2, some were 4.8, etc. But I was still able to count pretty well by taking the average. That's what we have with atoms. Okay? So let's talk about the mass spectrometer. So the mass spectrometer is an amazing device. As you can see, it looks pretty similar to um, JJ Thompson's cathode ray tube. It got inspiration from JJ Thompson's cathode ray tube. And the way this device works, you put a sample, and I'll just write atoms or molecules. That's what our sample is. We throw them into this device. This heater vaporizes them, so it turns it into a gas. Okay. We have this um, electron beam, and that electron beam is going to be very similar to the X-ray beam in Robert Millikan's device. So it ionizes these atoms or molecules. Okay. And you have, again, more electric, electrically charged plates that will accelerate those ions, okay? And then, of course, they enter this magnetic field, and what happens is the least massive ions are able to bend more than the most massive ions. So again, if we have this collection of atoms and molecules, we scoop up our collection of atoms and molecules. Some of them will be one flavor, another will be a different flavor, right? Some will be heavy, some will be light. The mass spectrometer can actually separate those by their mass and not only separate them by the mass, but calculate what the mass had to be. So imagine if we took a sample of neon. So neon is a noble gas, uh, makes pretty colorful lights, like a neon light, duh, okay? So um, if you throw some neon into this mass spectrometer, the mass spectrometer would actually tell you there's three flavors of neon. You would never guess with your naked eye, but there's three flavors of neon. Neon 20, neon 21, and neon 22, okay? Obviously, neon 21 has one more neutron than neon 20, and neon 22 has two more neutrons than neon 20, all right? And so what the mass spectrometer is able to determine is the exact mass. And I want to stress the exact mass in atomic mass units, AMU. We're going to get into that um, soon. I think probably the next lecture, the atomic mass unit. Anyways, for now, just think of this as a number, okay? And so you can see neon 20 is very close to 20. It's 19.992, but all the same, it's very close to 20. Neon 21 is 20.994, very close to being 21. And neon 22 is 21.991, being very close to 22, okay? So these are the exact masses. The average mass of neon is a result of all three of these. So when I go and scoop up some neon, it's impossible for me to separate those different isotopes. So the amount of neon I have would be based on some average. It would be like this number right here. Even though I know some of them I've scooped up are 20, 21, or 22, just like the jelly beans. Some of them I've scooped up are 5.2, 4.8, etc. Okay? And so what this mass, also what this mass spectrometer can tell us is how um, abundant each of these isotopes are, and so it would determine that um, neon 20 is by far the most abundant based on the size of this peak. So in other words, um, this detector plate right here would be getting um, hit by 
neon 20s on average more than neon 21 or 22. So you can think of this as like counts, this peak, like how many times that particular mass has hit the detector. Okay, And so that's what we call the natural abundance. So neon 20 is 90.6 natural abundance. All right. You don't have to memorize these numbers because we can find them on the periodic table. So this is the last um, little bit that I'm going to talk about, okay? And then I'll end this lecture because I think this has been going on for a little bit, all right? So let's talk about average and exact masses. So we've talked about exact masses, right? That's what this whole thing is about. So what's the average mass, okay? Well, the average mass is the average of all of the exact masses. Okay, not too, not too bad, okay? And as it turns out, okay, our atomic masses, the AMU, are entirely based off of carbon-12, carbon flavor-12. I don't know if you knew that or not, but we've based the entire periodic table of masses off of carbon flavor-12, okay? So we just, we, we have to set the scale somewhere, right? So we say carbon-12 is exactly 12 AMU. We also call this Dalton's for the name of the scientist, John Dalton, okay? So you can say 12 uh, Dalton, 12 Daltons, and that equals 12 AMU, okay? So as it turns out, in the original, like, you know, setting up of all these masses and the original, like, programming of the first mass spectrometers, you had to give it some type of known mass. So that's called calibrating. So we had to calibrate the mass spectrometer somehow. So all mass spectrometers in the periodic table has been calibrated off of carbon-12, okay? And so now what you're able to do based on how much the light particle separates from the heavy particle, and if you're having a hard time understanding this analogy, just imagine like you're, you're you know, driving in a race car and you're going around some turn and you're in some super light car, like maybe a Honda Civic, and somebody else is in like a massive truck and you're both going the same speed. Just imagine like both people throwing the wheel and how easy it would be for the Honda Civic to make that sharp turn versus like the big massive truck, okay? And doing a lot of physics and calculus and math you can then say, well, what had to be the mass difference between those um, based on that deflection, okay? So, for example, if you wanted to know, well, how much does a carbon-13 weigh? So what the mass spectrometer actually does is take the ratio, okay? So now if I say the mass of a carbon-13 divided by the mass of carbon-12 turns out to be 1.0836129, and the precision is just being on and on and on and on and on and on and on. Okay, always updated to have more and more and more precision. So that means through algebra, because we know the mass of carbon-12 has to be exactly 12. So if this is exactly 12, and I mean like no sig figs, like exactly 12, then we can do algebra, right? Multiply both sides by 12, and then you separate uh, uh, carbon-13, and thus the mass of carbon-13 has to be 13.0033555 AMU. That is the exact mass of carbon-13. The exact mass of carbon-12 is exactly 12, okay? So then how do we get the average mass? Okay, one last slide for this lecture. It's a calculation, all right? So here's how this is going to go. We also know from the mass spectrometer that the natural abundance of carbon-12 is 98.89%. So it's the vast majority of carbon is carbon-12. About 1% is carbon-13. And actually, a fraction of a fraction of a percent is carbon-14. Okay, I'm not going to talk about it on the slide. Um, carbon-14 um, is radioactive, and it what, it's what allows us to do radiocarbon dating. Okay, so we'll talk more about that in Chem 110. So for now, um, we'll say ignore carbon-14, but let's talk about carbon-13. Okay, so based on the following data, calculate the average mass of a sample of carbon. So how do we do that? Well, if my natural, here's my natural abundance, and I'll just remind you that I can write a percentage by dividing by 100, right? I can go 1, 2, 
and I can go 1, 2. So I can say 0 0.9889, and here I can say 0 0.0111. Okay, so pay attention. I want you to know how to do this calculation, okay? We get the average mass of a sample of carbon. I'm going to write um, uh, just mass of carbon, okay? I'll just say a C for now, and I'll put brackets. That means average, okay? So it's going to be the natural abundance times the mass plus the natural abundance times the mass, okay? So I don't have a, a formula for you, but this is how it's going to go. It's going to go 0 0.9889 times exactly 12. And so here, because we're not worried about the sig figs here, from here we have 1, 2, 3, 4 sig figs, okay? Plus... 0 0.0111 times 13.0033355. And we're going to use all of these sig figs, and excuse me, units, right? This is an AMU unit, and this is an AMU unit, okay? And so now, when I go and do this calculation, okay, four sig figs here, so I get 11.87. AMU, when I take 12 times this, and then one, two, three sig figs here, I get 0 0.144 AMU here. But now check it out, I'm adding two numbers, right? And I've got two decimal places and three decimal places. So my final answer is going to have two decimal places, okay? So that gives me 12.01 AMU. And if we go to the periodic table, let's find a periodic table real quick. Let me find a better one. Oh, no, do I have one in here? Uh, wah, wah, wah. I don't have a good periodic table in here. So if we were to look, so there's a periodic table in the lecture hall, but we're not in the lecture hall. Anyways, uh, if we were to look at a periodic table, I got one right here somewhere. Okay. We would see the average mass of a sample of carbon. Yes. Okay. You guys are going to dislike me for doing this. Find carbon. It says 12.01. Okay. So that's what's on the periodic table. I would encourage you to dig up a periodic table. Go look on the masses on the periodic table. That mass that you see on the periodic table is the average mass. It's a result of these isotopes. Okay. I'm going to stop this video. I'll pull up a better periodic table on my screen. I apologize. I didn't have one ready. Okay. Um, okay, folks, stay tuned for the next video.